Hey everyone, it is officially that time of the year. It is final exam season and the point of this video is to get you moving in the right direction when it comes to being successful on this element of the class, this final element of the class. We've made it. We've finally gotten to that point in the semester. What I want you to do if you haven't done this already is get yourself a copy of your one-stop shop review document. Of course, I'm talking about the final exam review guide. It's right there in Canvas. Click on modules, scroll down to exam review resources, and uh, click on the final exam review guide and you'll see what I'm talking about. So now that you've got that up in front of you, let me talk a little bit about the logistics because this is going to walk, talk, act, and feel an awful lot like the midterm exam. First things first, it's going to be taken there in Canvas. There's no need to come in. It's all going to be done online. As long as you've got a good computer and a good internet connection, you are in business for this element of the class. The next thing I want you to understand, the next similarity, I guess you might say, is that it's very similar in the sense that it's got two sections, both of which, just like last time, both of which are independent of one another. You've got your multiple choice section, and then separately, you've got your uh, 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 essay section, okay? And it doesn't matter which one you do first. It doesn't matter if you want to take a break, um, even if that is an extended break, in between the two sections. All I really care about is that both of those sections are done by the time that it's specified in both Canvas as well as the course syllabus. Now. Um, because it's going to be very similar to what you saw in the midterm last time and because you've, you've, you've been taking this class for weeks and weeks, this review video is going to be a lot lighter than the first time around. You've seen it before, you've done it before. Again, just like last time, that term bank, all those terms, those are going to be my building blocks for the multiple choice questions. If you have some familiarity with what each one of them is and how it fits into the bigger, broader picture of our class, you're going to be able to effectively navigate your way through the multiple choice questions. Once again, you don't need a dissertation quality understanding of any or all of those things. If you use the note card approach just like last time, it's going to go a long, long way when it comes to narrowing things down and simplifying this whole definition process, reminding your brain why that term is important and what you should do with it as far as this class is concerned. So just like last time, um, the, 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 the formatting of those multiple choice questions is going to be pretty familiar. So you should have some good experience there. But of course, if you've got specific questions, you know how to get a hold of me, either through my office hours or you can always send me an email. Okay. For the time being, I, I want to break down the written part, the essay section of the exam. Again, the essay section is anything that requires you to type out words or sentences. So it's going to consist of both those short answer responses. You'll answer them in two or four sentences or, or and or the long answer essay. So let's start out with those short response questions. Unlike last time, where you got your choice, which three of the four you wanted to prepare for, unlike last time, everyone needs to answer that Republican Party question. Don't have a choice there. Everybody needs to talk about what, if any, accomplishments the Republican Party made in that time period known as Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War. I want you to think about some of those laws that came out during and after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment, the later stages of the Civil War, that eradicates slavery. It makes slavery illegal. The first, last, and only reference to slavery in the U.S. Constitution was that it was illegal as far as the Constitution is concerned. That's an accomplishment. The 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship. This whole idea of overturning the Dred Scott decision in 1857 that legally defined the enslaved population as property which could be taken anywhere. The 14th Amendment will make anybody born in these United States a, a, a card-carrying citizen of these United States. And of course, the former enslaved population would qualify as such. So it's going to make that population and anybody else in the future born in these United States, it's going to make them a citizen, hence birthright citizenship, with full and equal protection under the law. That's an accomplishment. And lastly, the 15th Amendment, all black men and white men and everybody in between are able to vote. Universal male suffrage 
African American men are allowed to vote now. It's about holding those people, making laws accountable, and if you don't like the laws that they're making or they're not enforcing those laws, they can be voted out of office. Those are accomplishments. Now, obviously, there are challenges as well. Sharecropping, the, the fact that most of the formerly enslaved didn't have access to land and were forced to basically work on it and share the harvest, that wasn't a very great way of putting these people on their feet economically. Um, we see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And even though one of the accomplishments of U.S. Grant was the eradication of the Klan, certainly the Klan posed a problem um, in, in, in both the long term and the short term for the future. And you had those black codes, right? These sneaky laws that were designed to stop or at least intimidate the newly freed, uh, newly freed men and women from exercising their citizenship rights. So as you can see, there's some give and take when it comes to the accomplishments of Reconstruction. But one way or another, everybody needs to answer that question. Now, the other two questions, you have your choice, either or. If you want to answer the question, the economic and philosophically economic differences between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, you can, you can choose to answer that one, or you can choose to answer the philosophical evolution of Abraham Lincoln when it involves slavery, okay? Doesn't matter to me which one. So here's the thing. Even though everyone has to answer one of those questions, you don't have a choice, at least you know exactly which two to prepare for. Prepare for the Republican Party question and then choose one of the other ones. You don't have to worry about the one that you do not choose. So you now know exactly which two to prepare for as you go through getting ready for the exam. Lastly, you've got the long answer essay. Just like last time, that thing's not going to change between now and when you open up that exam. So you can begin making your preparations as we speak right now and adding to them and revising them and adding to them again. That's, that's the nice part about um, having this question, even though it's very abstract, having this question ahead of time. On day one, we started talking about this concept of America the Great Exception. Is America the Great Exception? That's what I asked you. Or are we the flavor of the month? Have we seen great civilizations come and go, which would have certainly defined themselves as exceptions to other great civilizations? How do we stack up? How do we compare with those other great civilizations of the past? Okay, that was the question that I asked you on day one, and now we're coming full circle. Okay, I think it's relatively fair to say that there were three issues that were very challenging, that, that posed very clear and present dangers to this idea, even, even if we're not going to agree that it's there, it, it, even the idea of America the Great Exception, the growth of government, okay? As the government got bigger and bigger and more and more powerful and more and more centralized, it certainly challenged some of the core principles of the American Revolution, okay? Next, the rise of industry. Once you begin to have these workers that um, really need those jobs, um, it, it's almost like Jefferson's prediction be, be, be became a truth. You keep in mind, Thomas Jefferson did not like the idea of industrialization because he said it would inevitably lead to dependency. Workers would be dependent upon their bosses. That was a prediction that, in ways, and in certain parts of the country, came true. Lastly, and probably most obviously, you've got chattel slavery, okay? The idea that the United States, a, a, a country that was conceived on the principle of human freedom, you had people sold and bought every day, even in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., there were slave auctions every day. There was something deeply contradictory about that concept. So if you take those three things and you break them down, that's going to be a very effective way of coming at this central question. Think about something like the growth of government, for example, okay? The growth of government, um, you see it very early on in American history. As a matter of fact, if you recall in that lecture um, uh, involving John Adams and his presidency, um, you see it two presidencies deep into American history. John Adams is trying to keep a lid on some of these dirty little secrets that are coming out of Europe because he knows that we're not exactly in a position to challenge France, and that's exactly what the American people are going to demand if they start to get wind of what's going on in the high seas in what historians refer to as the quasi-war, okay? 
Now, what John Adams does to that end is he passes three of the most anti-small-d democratic laws in American history. You got the Alien Act, you got the Naturalization Act, you got the Sedition Act, all of which exponentially expand the growth of governmental power and pose a very clear and present danger to these concepts of self-rule, of democratic rule. And we're two presidencies deep. You can make other, you know, inferences when it comes to the growth of government over the course of um, the, the 19th century as well. You know, when people like Henry Clay begin to po propose these public works projects, you've got people from South Carolina that are talking about the dangers of the growth of government. We talked about that in the War of 1812. We talked about that as industrialization began to redefine the American economy. Now, Speaking of industrialization, um, that's another clear and present danger to this concept of the American Declaration of Independence, the idea that all men are created equal. We saw the erosion of equality when we saw industrialization reshaping the political landscape. Bottom line is you've got a very small handful of Americans um, that own the factories, that own the mills, that own the foundries, and they're in charge of the working and sometimes non-working lives of huge armies of Americans. Case in point, Harriet Martineau. Harriet Martineau was one of those working girls from Lowell, Massachusetts. She worked in the factories, and um, she pointed out that in addition to telling workers what to do and how to do it while they were on the job, while they were being paid, the company was also telling workers what they could and couldn't do even on their downtime, even after the whistle had blown. Keep in mind, Harriet Martineau did not appreciate being told by the company that if she continued to go to dance class, she wouldn't have a job there the next day. Company said, well, you're going to be too tired, not going to be as productive, and we can't have that. Bottom line is, what I do with my spare time, my non-working time, as far as she was concerned, that ought to be my business and none of your affair. If you can't tell the difference of my productivity, then it's none of your business. Industrialization is reshaping the world of politics in that way because it's telling workers what they can and can't do. I mean, you got to ask yourself, how equal? What's, what's happening to the institution of equality? How equal are we if that happens to be the case? So I'm hopeful that that's jogging your memory a little bit. But the big one, guys, is going to be slavery. Now, obviously, this ran counter to the concept of the American Revolution. It flew in the face of the Enlightenment, all of which was very much on the minds of the framers of the Constitution. But I want to point out Abraham Lincoln and why he was so opposed to slavery. The idea that, that these people, the, the, these slave owners, on the one hand, they didn't really produce anything. It was the slaves themselves that produced the wealth. All the slave owners really did was kind of attach themselves to the labor uh, of the slaves and rob the slaves of the fruits of that labor. But when the Supreme Court basically said that slavery could be taken anywhere, including those Western territories, as far as people like Lincoln was concerned, that was blasphemy. It, it, it was the height of hypocrisy in terms of the very concepts of Jeffersonian democracy and the Declaration of Independence. And that these two things, these two worlds, one free and, and one slave, they could not coexist or they couldn't coexist for very much longer. And so you can see how and why the, the, this, the, this institution of slavery, on the one hand, very obviously inconsistent with the principles of the American Revolution, but how it, it was very, very much in putting in jeopardy this experiment, this American experiment with, experiment with democracy. So um, once again, I can't say enough good things about that five paragraph essay approach. Obviously an intro, obviously a conclusion. Paragraph one, growth of government. Talk to me about it. Bring some examples, like I brought some examples in. Paragraph two, industrialization. I rattled off Harriet Martineau, that's a good example, but Seth Luther, Thomas Skidmore, they make very good uh, examples as well. Paragraph three, slavery. Now, Dred Scott and Abraham Lincoln, certainly those are obvious cases to be made, but there are more ways than that than you can bring in and, 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 and get creative when it comes to how and why slavery threatened this great experiment in democracy. So I hope that that has helped you in, in, in the business of preparation. If nothing else, I'm hopeful that you feel a little bit better after having watched this video. Like I said uh, a few minutes ago, if you've got specific questions, you got something that you want to ask me, you can jump onto my office hours or you can email me. You know how to get a hold of me. 
Good luck, everybody. Uh, I'm wishing you the best, rooting hard for you. Let me know if I can be of assistance.